Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Once again, thanks for tuning in. Today, we'll be providing our weekly modeling and data and give an update on our Vermont Forward progress, in addition to our usual vaccination update from Secretary Smith and a health update from Dr. Levine. I'll be joining the White House call, as I usually do, on Tuesdays in a few minutes, and then come back to give an update on what uh, we hear. As you may know, as of yesterday, uh, Vermont has vaccinated 79.4% of the eligible population, leaving us just 3,139 more to go before we hit 80%. And at that point, all remaining restrictions will be dropped. There's still dozens of free walk-in opportunities available every day across the state. No appointment needed, which Secretary Smith will talk about, and it's never been easier to get your vaccination. So please help us get to 80% as fast as possible. Uh, over the weekend, I went to a few pop-up locations myself, including Thunder Road on Friday and the car show in St. Albans on Saturday. So I want to, again, once again, uh, thank our EMS teams who have been doing an incredible job at all these locations, all these clinics. We wouldn't be leading the nation in vaccinations if not for them. We're now at the stage where instead of mass vaccination sites with hundreds of doses being administered each day, uh, we're relying on pop-ups with a handful at a time. And that's okay. We're going to keep pushing uh, because every single dose could save a life and every vaccination counts. And we continue to see the impacts of vaccinations uh, with just two people in the entire state hospital, hospitalized, hospitalized with COVID-19. Cases are also at the lowest levels in eight months. So we need to keep this up, keep pushing, and keep leading the nation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for this week's modeling presentation, and I'll be back shortly with an update from the White House. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Governor, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to report uh, that for the second week in a row, we can say that Vermont is the safest state in the country from the risks of COVID-19. New COVID-19 cases have continued to fall in Vermont. This week, we're only reporting 61 new cases, 33 fewer than last week's already low total. And since our new key, uh, case peak on April 1st, our seven-day case average has fallen 94%, and we've fallen another 17% over the past week. Also this past week, we only had three cases among those 65 or older, and cases are also falling uniformly across all of our age groups, with each age group seeing their cases lower than at any point over the past eight months. Further, cases are following across Vermont, with 11 counties seeing a decrease this week, and with those counties seeing an increase, it was with very, very small numbers. And also, for the second week in a row, Franklin County has not reported a single COVID-19 case. New cases continue to closely follow our April 26th forecast, and our new extended forecast anticipates that cases will stay very low and even get lower throughout the rest of the month and into July. Further hospitalizations due to COVID-19 remain very, very low, and they continue to fall, declining 38% over the past week and 52% over the past 14 days resulting in Vermont maintaining the lowest hospitalization rate in the country. In fact, this week we frequently reported zero patients in our ICUs across the state, the first time we've seen such few people requiring critical care in nearly eight months. And we forecast that hospitalization rates will remain low for the foreseeable future. Further, we now estimate that the vaccine has saved 260 lives in Vermont more than the number of COVID-19 deaths that Vermont has experienced to date. Again, highlighting the power of this life-saving vaccine. And although our fatality rate continues to be very low, we unfortunately did have a COVID-19 death reported this week, making it our only COVID-19 death reported in the last three weeks. 
And with very, very few new COVID-19 cases, especially among our most vulnerable populations, we continue to forecast that Vermont will have five or fewer deaths in the month of June, a remarkable improvement from where we were just four short months ago. Further, we're seeing these favorable trends even while mobility data shows that Vermonters are continuing to move around at pre-pandemic levels. Further, we have our first glance at mobility data associated with Memorial Day weekend, and the number of hotel visitors increased substantially this year compared to last, up 278%. However, Hotel visits were still down about 21% compared to 2019 before the pandemic. This should, however, certainly be an encouraging sign for the summer tourism season. Turning to our vaccination progress, uh, Vermont continues to lead the nation across almost every vaccine category. We now have the most doses gener uh, administered generally and also among the 65 and older population. We have the highest percentage of our residents having started vaccination. And new as of this week, we also have the highest percentage of our population that is fully vaccinated as well. Taking a look at the last two weeks, we can see that new vaccine vaccinations were following, falling a little bit following Memorial Day weekend. However, over the last three days, our numbers have rebounded nicely. And as the governor said, we're making good progress toward our goal of 80%. Again, as you can see, we stand at 79.4% of eligible Vermonters having started vaccination, needing just 3,139 more to hit our goal, something that we think is likely uh, this week uh, if the current pace holds. And since we're on the cusp of reopening fully and knowing that this might cause some anxiety for those out there, we wanted to analyze the COVID-19 trends in three other New England states that have recently fully reopened. First with New Hampshire, which fully reopened on May 7th, we see that they have continued to see a steady downward trend in their cases over the last four weeks. Similarly, the same story holds for Connecticut, which reopened on May 19th and has continued to see a similar downward trend in their cases over the past three weeks. And finally, this holds true also for Rhode Island that reopened on May 21st and they've continued to see their cases drop over the past few weeks as well. And for each of these three states that we mentioned, uh, each of them reopened at a time when their vaccination rates were lower and their case rates were higher than compared to Vermont. And further, even here in Vermont, we see that our cases continued to fall after each of the steps of the Vermont Forward Plan. All of this should certainly give us confidence that we can safely take the final step and reopen Vermont safely when we hit 80%. Finally, taking a look at the region, for the ninth straight week, cases are falling across the Northeast. Cases this week totaled uh, 8,400, the first time we've reported fewer than 10,000 cases over the last nine months. Over the last nine weeks, cases have fallen 91% in the Northeast and hospitalizations and deaths continue to fall as well. We're also seeing nice improvements in Canada and specifically in Quebec, where cases have fallen over 30% this week and their vaccination rates continue to climb with 66% of its population having started vaccination, a rate that rivals Vermont's. This should all spell uh, good news for the reopening of the US-Canadian border, hopefully in the near future. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek, and good morning, everyone. I'll start off this morning with an update on our progress with the vaccination program, as well as announce more convenient locations where you can walk in and get your shot this week. And then I'll end with a preview of what is expect expected this upcoming weekend with more details to come later in the week. We are inching forward, as everyone has mentioned, 
toward our goal of vaccinating 80% of eligible, eligible Vermonters. Over the weekend, many Vermonters stepped up to get vaccinated. As of this morning, as, as has been previously mentioned, 74.4% of eligible Verm Vermonters, those 12 years old and above, have been vaccinated with at least one dose. We need just 3,139 more Vermonters to get their shot. As you can see, we are really close. I wanted to thank all those Vermonters who stepped up to get vaccinated this week, and I urge all eligible unvaccinated Vermonters to take advantage of the many convenient opportunities statewide to get your shot. Please do your part to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community. In terms of overall progress as of today, as it mentioned, Vermonters 12 plus with at least one dose, 79.4%. Vermonters 18 plus with at least one dose using CDC data. This, I use this uh, metric because the White House uses this metric in measuring their progress towards their July 4th uh, goal of over 70% of Americans vaccinated 18 plus with one dose. We're way past that right now. We're at 82.9% uh, of the White House goal. All Vermonters with at least one dose, 70.1% as Commissioner Pichek had pointed out. Moving on to vaccine clinics, you can walk in and get your shot at a variety of locations, including CVS, Hannaford Food and Drugs, Walmart, Walgreens, Price Chopper Mar Market 32, Rite Aid, Shaw's Market, Costco, or UVM MC Pharmacies. You can also make an appointment with Kenny Drugs or Northfield Pharmacy. And there are many more pop-up clinics today through Thursday. Today, June 8th, uh, you can go to Northwest, uh, Northwestern Medical Center, uh, Trey Amigos in Stowe, North Country Hospital in Newport, Barton Fair, Fairground drive through in, um, in Barton, Tomorrow, Northwestern Medical Center, Okemo Valley Regional Chamber of Commerce, uh, Nolanto GW in Royalton, uh, the American Legion with Porter Medical uh, Center in Middlebury, and then on Thursday, uh, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital, Northwestern Medical Center, Smuggler's Notch Resort, and Waterbury Farmers Market. There are also opportunities at our health care, our health partner clinics throughout the state. Please visit the website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or call 855-722-7878. Stay tuned later in the week for another update with the new walk-in opportunities, including clinics at over 20 Vermont state parks. This is exciting. Along with the free admission to the Vermont State Parks this weekend, we will have vaccination crews at many of the state parks to offer COVID-19 vaccine. We will also be back at the Jazz Fest this weekend as well. I'll wrap it up, but I do want to first thank all our EMS, healthcare, pharmacy, health department, and National Guard partners who have supported us to lead the nation in vaccinating our population. But there is, that's only the tip of the iceberg. There are hundreds, literally too many to highlight, that are behind the scenes handling the logistics to make our efforts a success. I wish to thank them as well. Uh, it has been an amazing team effort. I also want to thank Vermonters, especially Vermonters, for stepping up and making this all possible. However, we still have a bit to go, and I urge everyone to consider getting vaccinated this week so we can reach our goal and get back to normal. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Shirley. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Good morning, everyone. Uh, with our progress on COVID-19 vaccinations and the move toward normalcy in many activities around Vermont, the recent weather has many looking for a way to cool down. 
uh, and Vermont lakes and swimming areas and swimming holes are popular with Vermonters and visitors and create a great respite from the heat. Uh, those spots have been incredibly busy in the last few days. As you venture out to spend time in Vermont's abundant parks, playgrounds, trails, and beaches, it's important to take time to think about safety. We want to take a couple of minutes just to remind folks that natural swimming areas like rivers and gorges can pose dangerous uh, conditions, especially if you don't know the area. Last weekend, our Swift Water Rescue Team was called to the Huntington Gorge to assist the Richmond Fire Department with the rescue of two people who suddenly found themselves in danger and couldn't exit the water on their own. Fortunately, help arrived, and they only suffered minor injuries. Unfortunately, with that gorge and a few others around Vermont, that's not always the case, as they've seen a number of tragedies over the years. There are a number of things you can do to mitigate the risk when swimming, especially in those types of areas. First, never swim alone. Uh, if, whether you're in a, a lake or river, a swimming pool uh, or a pond, uh, even if you're an expert swimmer, there's always the potential for something uh, unforeseen to happen. A medical emergency or something else could strike at any time. So have someone with you who can call for help in an emergency. Fortunately for the folks in the gorge over the weekend, they had a third party with them who was able to call for help uh, and, and help facilitate uh, their rescue really swiftly. Next, know the body of water before you go in. The water depth, the temperature, prevailing currents, the location of hidden rocks and other hazards are all important factors in staying safe. Talk with someone who has been there before, do some research before you swim there. Uh, and remember, heavy rains and weather conditions can dramatically impact currents, water depth, and the conditions. Water is incredibly powerful, even when it's moving in small, uh, what appears to be small amounts. Uh, a small amount of moving water can easily overwhelm a person and may even be able to push a car or something larger. Next, be, re be realistic about your abilities. In a pool, you can always grab for the side, but on a river or a lake, you can get into some significant trouble if you don't have something in proximity or something, some kind of flotation device to assist you. Always swim sober. Drugs and alcohol can dull your senses, they can impair your judgment, they can, they can slow your response, and they can appear, uh, impair your ability to swim. And finally, respect property postings. If an area is posted for no trespassing or no swimming, please be respectful of that. Those postings are there for a reason. Often that reason is for underlying safety concerns about that particular swimming location. For more information about swimming safety, you can visit the Vermont Emergency Management site, vem.vermont.gov slash swim safety. There are many outdoor places to enjoy around our state. Having a little bit of safety in mind will make your visit to those places the best it can be. Um, and while you might enjoy meeting Dr. Levine or one of his many colleagues, it would be far better to do so at one of the uh, long list of vaccine clinics that Secretary Smith just mentioned, rather than doing so in an emergency room. With that, I will just turn it over to Dr. Levine. I'll echo those last sentiments. And uh, I hope many of you are enjoying the warm weather and summer activities, taking um, in all that Vermont has to offer and reconnecting with family and friends as more and more of us are protected by the COVID vaccine every day. The vaccine is the reason we've gotten to where we are today. It's how we can live once again with fewer restrictions and ultimately end the pandemic. So if you're not yet vaccinated, I ask you to stay as healthy as possible this summer and beyond by protecting yourself from this disease. Do the same for your family and friends. Remember, the vaccine is free. You can get it almost anywhere in your community, and it's been proven to be both safe and effective. In fact, there are a number of real-world experience studies from this year, including a large one I've discussed here previously, involving high-risk frontline healthcare workers and other frontline workers that have documented vaccine safety and over 90% effectiveness. These results mirror the original clinical trial results from the original studies. Though you might have some side effects after getting vaccinated, 
They are normal signs that your body is building protection. Some people may feel a bit off for a day, but people don't have side effects at all in many cases. And now, at the one-year mark since the original trials began, long-term adverse effects are just not being seen. And to speak directly to anyone who may have questions or doubts, first, that's totally fine. You should have the information you need. I urge you to get your answers from trusted sources. It's easy to fall prey to misinformation, and we simply can't afford to let those who spread it set us back in our efforts to keep us all safe and healthy. Start, if you will, by checking our frequently asked questions at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. We have a lot of information there that was inspired by questions we get every day from other Vermonters. I think you'll find them helpful in your being comfortable and confident in getting vaccinated. Right now, Vermont enjoys the greatest degree of protection for its population among all 50 states, and we continue to build on this success. The fact is, public health experts are getting increasingly concerned about a summer surge in the South, where many states have vaccination rates half of Vermont's. They're calling these states sitting ducks. Well, I don't really wish an outcome like that on anyone, but I too am concerned because the large numbers of unvaccinated people in those states will transmit the virus to one another, and there will be no such thing as community immunity, whether there are variant strains or not. We have good evidence that our vaccination rate is producing the desired results here in Vermont. First, with dramatic fall off in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in our older citizens. Several months ago, that began. Next, in the sudden major cases that we've seen. And of course, our overall case numbers and percent positivity rates. We know the virus does not respect state borders, so our vaccination and testing successes are our protection now and for the future. For parents and caregivers of a child over age 12, I hope you'll also seek out a convenient location that offers the Pfizer vaccine, which has been approved for the 12 to 17 age group. You can find walk-in clinics on our website or check with your local pharmacies. I know the approval for this age group is more recent, but let me assure the parents, caregivers, and these young Vermonters, clinical studies show the vaccines are also safe and effective for 12 to 17 year olds. Any short term side effects from the vaccine appear to be similar to what adults may experience. And we have the benefit of data from millions of adults that have now been fully vaccinated. Hundreds of millions. Now, we know hospitalization rates for adolescents are much lower than for adults, but severe disease can occur in any age group. As the CDC just reinforced for us in published experience from 14 states during the recent spring surge. Among hospitalized adolescents, nearly one third required intensive care unit admission and 5% had to be placed on a ventilator. No associated deaths occurred. This report reinforces the importance of continuing COVID-19 prevention measures, which include vaccination and correct and consistent mask wearing among persons who are not fully vaccinated. We know how much kids have missed out this past year and a half and how ready they are to finish school strong, get back to their friends, sports, camps, vacations, without having to worry about being exposed to the virus or having to quarantine and to be protected at the beginning of the next school year. Simply put, we use vaccines to keep our children safe from so many diseases. And the COVID-19 vaccine is really no different. It keeps them from getting sick from coronavirus. It means we don't need to worry about the rare but real threat of a severe or serious hospitalization multi-system inflammatory syndrome, or long COVID. 
and it means there's less chance of it spreading to others, including younger family members who can't yet be vaccinated. Vaccines give them the immunity they need without the disease. As well as we're doing in Vermont, COVID-19 is not going to disappear. It can and will continue to find its way among people who do not have that wall of protection to stop it in its tracks. So we still need your help to get as many Vermonters protected as possible. Your decision to get vaccinated still matters. With that, we can start with the questions. Yeah, so the governor is just wrapping up his call with the White House and fellow governors, and he'll be down in a couple minutes for the readout. So we'll move to the Q&A. And for those up at the front, if you have a question for the governor, uh, just let me know and we can come back to you. But I'd just like to remind folks, uh, per my email when I sent out the queue, we've got a longer queue today, so we're hoping uh, we can limit to two questions. And if you have another one, just send me a text or an email and we can come back to you uh, for a follow-up at the end. Uh, time allowing. So we'll start with Calvin Cutler, Channel 3. Um, thanks. I'll, I'll wait for the governor. Okay. All set. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. You there, Stuart? Hey, uh, I would like to wait for the governor okay. as well, please. Wilson Ring, Associated Press. Uh, hi, I'll be interested to hear what the governor says when he comes back too, but I have another question. I think this is for Commissioner Harrington. And I'm curious in the, I don't know, how many weeks it's been since you restarted the work search requirement and unemployment, has that affected anything at all? Any changes in uh, you know, more people going back to work or has it changed anything at all? Uh, thanks, Wilson. Um, we have seen a reduction in the number of weekly claims or continued claims uh, since the work search has gone back into place. We've also seen the amount of claims that we're paying out, uh, the dollar amount, uh, go down week after week. Um, so those numbers continue to come down uh, pretty drastically. Um, I think some of it is a combination of turning the work search back on, um, but I also think there's a component in there um, in some of our numbers that we've shared previously, there was a steep decline in new claims and continued claims as we begin and have started to put in um, fraud mitigation efforts. Uh, so we saw the number of claims uh, being filed, uh, new claims being filed on a weekly basis drop by 90%. And we've been able to also make drastic changes in the number of weekly claims being filed um, through our fraud mitigation efforts. So um, I think it's a combination of both, but we do know there are people who are um, looking for work and have gone back to work. So we do see uh, weekly claims coming down as well as the total uh, amount being paid out in benefits each week going down as well. Is it helping to ease the labor crunch? I think it's too soon to tell. Um, we know that the labor um, shortage that Vermont experienced was there prior to the pandemic. So it certainly is helping. Um, but I would say that our employers are still struggling to find um, talented, talented uh, workers. And, um, you know, so we're going to keep uh, encouraging folks to continue looking for work and go back to work. But I don't think that's going to resolve the total issue. Uh, we'll still be in a need, in a position of needing to expand our workforce even after um, the, the additional folks who are on unemployment due to COVID uh, go back to work. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Uh, thanks, Jason. I've got uh, two for the governor, so I'll wait. Thanks. Okay. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. I've got one for the governor and one for Commissioner Pichak. Um, so, Commissioner Pichak, can you provide us with the average age of people being diagnosed with COVID in the last four weeks? And if not today, perhaps um, next week. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm happy to give you the average age, but I know the median age has been, um, you know, for weeks, not just the last four weeks, but maybe the last eight weeks, has, has been under 30 years old. 
Um, it's been around 25 years old. It bounced back a little bit to about 30 years old uh, recently. So that's the median age, not the average age, but you can get, you can get a sense that, that the cases are much younger now um, and can certainly include that in next week's presentation. And, and of those who are being diagnosed with COVID, do you have a sense of the median age of hospitalization? Yeah, so that's trended down as well. Um, you know, back in January, it was uh, well above 60 years old. It was like 65 years old was the average age. Uh, last month, it got down to like 51 years old, I believe. Um, in June, we haven't had a case that's been reported that's yet ended up in the hospital. So um, the most recent month, uh, full month of data that we have is May, which was just about 51 uh, years old was the average age. So that's come down quite a bit too. Great, thank you. And then Jason, I'll come back when the governor's here. Thank and I'll you. mute myself. Perfect, thank you. Greg Lamoureux, the county courier. Thanks, Jason. I, I think both of mine are for the governor. Okay. Ann Wallace Allen, seven days. All right, I'll move to Pete Hirschfeld, VPR. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. <clears throat> Thanks, Jason. I have one for the governor, but I also have one uh, for Commissioner Sherling. Uh, Commissioner, the uh, information about that incident at the Huntington Gorge uh, was helpful to see. However, <clears throat> it wasn't, uh, there wasn't enough information to understand. Did they actually go over the falls to get injured, or were they injured prior to that? Thanks for the question. I actually don't uh, know the, the, uh, the whole lineage of the event, but we can, uh, we can get back to you with that. Yeah, I'm sort of curious about uh, how they got themselves in that position in the first place, knowing the danger and the number of fatalities that have been uh, reported over the years there. Yeah, I agreed. And it, it is one of those areas that's posted that, uh, that I, I referenced uh, as well. So yeah, important, uh, important to note uh, that we're not endorsing um, going to Huntington Gorge to swim. Um, but I will uh, check with the Swift Water team and see if we can get some additional detail for you. Okay, much appreciated. That's it for now, Jason, thank you. Thank you, and I just got word that the governor is um, on his way down, he should be here any second. So I'll go to Kat from WCX if you have one for uh, anyone here now, and then we can come right back to you if the governor comes halfway through. I'll wait a moment and hear what the governor has to say from the national side. He's walking in the room right now. I was about to start filibustering or something, so he came just in time. Well, thanks again. Um, just off the call with the White House. Uh, today, Dr. Walensky reflected on the country's continued progress, including the 300 million dose milestone. Uh, and also the case counts lower than they've been since March of 2020, and the clear impact of vaccines in reducing hospitalizations and deaths. The CDC is encouraging teens and youth 12 and over to get vaccinated. So for those parents who aren't quite sure at this point, please know the country's top doctors are confident in the safety and effectiveness of, uh, of the vaccine for our youth. They also talked about concerns with misinformation, which is keeping some people from getting the vaccine. So I wanna remind folks, if you have questions, if you've seen rumors or claims online about the vaccine being unsafe, think about reaching out to your family doctor uh, who you trust and ask those questions uh, because vaccines are safe. And if you're reading something on Facebook you haven't seen anywhere else, it's probably not true. Finally, our allocations of Pfizer and Moderna doses remain the same, and there are no new allocations uh, for J&J, &J, but with what we've... Please know, the country's top doctors are... 
but with what we've been uh, getting each week, uh, we can meet our needs here in Vermont, uh, meaning with the steady stream, uh, we can continue to move forward towards our goal, which is uh, the site is, is close. So with that. Cat, because we were at you, I'll go back to you, then I'm gonna go back to the top of the list and work my way back down. I'm curious, you are keeping the data about how many travel and tourism bookings are returning. Are there other forms of data that you are keeping that you're going to be presenting at these to show us how the economy is kind of recovering this year in comparison to last year and then pre-pandemic? Well, I think we can use a, a few different metrics. Obviously, uh, hearing right from those on the ground, right on the front lines is important, um, but also watching some of the revenue data on a on a monthly and quarterly basis is going to inform us as to how the economy is doing. So um, I might ask Secretary Curley if there's anything else she might be looking at uh, within the ACCD uh, agency. Yeah, Governor, I think I'm happy to look uh, with our team at, at what uh, metrics we might share data that we could share to show people what's happening um, I think, you know, my first thought with what yours was was kind of looking at the revenue, the rooms and meals um, tax, and, you know, seeing what the trends are. But I think there are a variety of other reports that we can pull to um, be transparent about what's happening on the ground here as we um, come out of this crisis. Happy to do that. Uh, Kat, we're also... That would be awesome. Yeah. Kat, we're also monitoring... Uh, the traffic uh, in and out of the state on a weekly basis. So uh, that's another metric that uh, we keep an eye on. So that's important as well, as well as, uh, you know, the labor uh, situation. Uh, we've, uh, we've reduced uh, the number of people uh, with um, on unemployment. So that's, uh, that's good news, but we have a ways to go. And then I happened to notice from last week's data, it looked like um, while we had seen travel and uh, kind of the recreation side rebound to almost pre-pandemic levels and other metrics had hit pre-pandemic levels, um, you know, people going grocery shopping, things like that. But I noticed that workplaces were still about 30% or so where people had not gone back to work yet. Do you envision that number coming up anymore? Or do you think that that is probably where it's gonna land because companies have decided not to go back and send their workers back to an office. I think it's given good. remote work. Yeah, I, I believe it'll be a combination of the two. Uh, it'll be interesting to watch. Um, certainly, uh, putting more people back to work. I think that's going to be important. Uh, the more people get uh, vaccinated, the more normal we get. And uh, and with schools um, um, finishing off their year, as well, and uh, some of the summer matters programs coming into play. Uh, I think we'll see more people going back to work as well. Uh, Commissioner Pichek, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Governor. And, and Kat, you're right that, that uh, on the mobility data, the only one that really has not returned back to a more normal level is the workplace. And as the, you know, the Governor said, some of that is child care. Uh, some of that is just being able to work remotely, you know, um, and people wanting to stay remote. Some of it might be a reduction in the workforce as well. If there's fewer people traveling to work sites um, across the board, then the mobility data won't bounce back to the same degree. So I think it's a combination of all of those things, certainly. Thank you. All right, I'll go back to the top and work our way back through the order, starting with Calvin Cutler. Um, thank you. Governor, so uh, Commissioner Pichek at the beginning uh, mentioned that the uh, new data or vaccination data in Canada could spell good news in, in the weeks and months ahead. I'm wondering if you have any update on that front and if you have any response from uh, the, the letter to the Biden administration last week. Yeah, we have not received any, any word back from the Biden administration at this point in time, um, but we anxiously await the border reopening when it's safe. and. Uh, and I really don't have any more information than you do. Uh, we can all speculate. Uh, I think it's good news when uh, uh, the uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has uh, talked about getting to a certain point. Uh, it's either 70 or 75 percent. And uh, it looks like then things will be relaxing. And they've made terrific gains, particularly in Quebec. Uh, and uh, that's where we, of course, share 
our border with, and uh, they're they're exceeding expectations. And and really, um, the the first dose vaccination rate is uh, much higher than the U.S. at this point, uh, much higher uh, than the U.K. Uh, so they are heading towards, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, Israel's. Uh, Benchmark. So it's all good news. Uh, hopefully, uh, this means that the, they will negotiate something between the U.S. government and the Canadian government, and be able to open up the borders as soon as possible. And then the uh, second question, you know, you've, I'm sure you've seen you're getting some national attention for signing the um, uh, mail-in ballot uh, or vote by mail um, bill into law. I'm wondering if you can reflect on your action on that bill, given the context of other Republican governors, you know, putting restrictions on, on voting, and also how it will potentially change our elections going forward? Well, we had a chance, an opportunity uh, to try this out last year uh, during the general election. And I think it was worthwhile for Vermont. I think that uh, from my perspective, uh, I think more people getting to the polls to exercise their right to vote and, and offering their voice in, in that respect is important. And uh, I think we just need to continue to work on this. This will evolve. I'd like to see it expanded in some some ways. It was, you know, to just focus on the general election alone, when we see uh, the lowest percentage uh, of participation uh, in, uh, in our state is in the local elections and, uh, the, you know, school budgets and so forth. Um, so I'd like to see, you know, somewhere down around 20 percent, I believe. So we should be focusing on that area. We, we get uh, somewhat uh, decent uh, participation pre-pandemic in the general elections. Obviously, that could be better. And, it, and we showed that it, it proved uh, to be better once there was a mail-in uh, ballot. So um, I said after uh, we tried that out, it was worthwhile, and we decided to move forward with that. But we'll have to continue to monitor and make sure that we improve and, and put in any safeguards that we might need. Thanks. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. We could hear you, Stuart. We could. This uh, muting thing is going to be the death of me. <laughs> uh, do you have any update on the motel voucher program ending um, this month? Uh, we, we, we've we had a couple of questions about that, and one I got this morning asks if you'd comment on the morality of what they described as throwing people out. Uh, and secondly, given that Vermont did get some money uh, from the uh, the Sackler family uh, in the um, opioid settlement, uh, and so many of these folks uh, have struggled with opioid addiction. Should some of that money be used for transitional housing? Secretary Smith. Stuart Mike Smith here. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We. We've looked, you know, what we did during the pandemic was we took all restrictions off a program that was designed for a specific group, and that was emergency housing, somebody that was uh, didn't have housing for the night, for example, and opened it up to anybody uh, and everybody without restrictions. That program, with all the associated uh, cost to it, um, that includes meals, that includes rooms, uh, could have ballooned to over $100 million coming up in FY22. What we looked at was the, mo the best way, and we reached out and collaborated with advocates, the best way to sort of wind down this program in a compassionate way, recognizing that ultimately the 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 solution would be permanent housing. As you know, the governor put forth a permanent housing solution, and we are moving in that. I think it's $120 million moving into that area of, of, uh, of permanent housing uh, in, in, this, in this regard. We are not uh, moving out uh, 
people that are vulnerable uh, in this population. For example, you know, those with disability, those with children. Uh, we've actually expanded the eligibility requirements to keep into this program. We have put some restrictions back into the program that started June 1st for new applicants and will start July 1st for existing applicants. But we've also extended the deadline for those that are in the program as well. So we've done it in the most um, judicious, compassionate um, measure that we possibly can. We also have expanded shelter capacity and shelter capacity will continue to, um, to increase as, uh, as the pandemic winds down here. Uh, so the, the other thing is that we are offering stipends to people uh, that are leaving the program to help them transition uh, to other places as well. Many of people during the pandemic uh, were staying with relatives or friends, and because of the pandemic, it became a little bit, um, people became a little bit worried of congregating, so we, we took them into the hotel motel program. Those avenues are available now that people are getting vaccinated, so there are all these opportunities now that we're doing, including keeping the program at a, um, at a level that we have never done before, uh, keeping the program uh, running as we move forward. So do you know how many people then will be left in motel rooms in light of what you've just said about, uh, you know, extending um, the deadline and, and uh, trying to be as compassionate as you can be in the exclusions for people with kids and I think, that sort of thing. How many will you have left? I, I think 900 to 1,000 is what we're estimating. From a total of, you know, a couple of months ago, what? 2,600. 2,600? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks, Secretary. Uh, and do you do we know how many school districts have have sent kids into remote learning because of this uh, very warm weather we've had the uh, last couple of days. And is that, does that provoke, uh, prevent, uh, sorry, uh, uh, is that a health risk? Uh, Secretary French, are you on? Yes, I am, Governor. Um, Stuart, I'm unaware of any schools that have gone to remote learning as a result of the weather. Um, this is pretty typical weather this time of year, though it is, it is definitely warm in classrooms oh. right now. Okay. Well, 96 is not pretty normal, but um, okay. Thank you very much. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, um, I heard a local government board recently discussing reopening public meetings to in-person attendance and uh, however there was discussion about seeking proof of vaccination shots uh, from the audience i guess or otherwise limiting town hall to only board members that had the vaccine shots just wondering as far as the state is concerned what is the latest advice you're giving local governments about asking for proof of vaccination in order to Attend public meetings or going into town halls, uh, and can somebody be legally blocked from a public government meeting based on maybe not disclosing whether they had the shot or not? Well, again, Mike, uh, in a, uh, you know, within the next week, we're hoping to hit the 80% mark, and all restrictions uh, will be lifted. Uh, the emergency order will um, be allowed to uh, be discontinued. And uh, so things will be back to normal. So um, the best protection for anyone, and I think Dr. Levine can comment further on this, is to get vaccinated. You can protect yourself at that point, and you don't have to worry about that. Um, but uh, but when, when the safe emergency is over and all restrictions are lifted, uh, that means for those communities as well. Commissioner Levine. So once, once it's lifted, a local town can't say we still want to see your vaccination or you've got to wear a mask or they, they're not allowed to put any restrictions on. Um, 
not unless they declare some sort of targeted uh, health emergency within their community. So no, I, I guess the, the answer from my perspective and maybe um, our, our uh, attorney, our attorneys will, uh, will have a different of, difference of opinion. But from my perspective, uh, no, they won't be able to do that unless they declare some sort of health emergency. Okay, thanks, because I'm sure a lot of towns are going to be facing that same question, so that's good. Uh, my other question, Governor, any uh, update on the report that the uh, Department of Public Safety fired a state trooper uh, apparently over some flap over a mask with a private citizen in a store? I know they haven't been forthcoming, and just wondering if you made headway in the last 10 days to get anything out of the Public Safety Department. Mike, this is Dr. Levine. Before the governor uh, goes to that question, we just wanted to finish on the previous one. So obviously vaccination is the most optimal way to get rid of the problem that you were talking about in the first place. But um, though there will be no requirements after we reach the 80 percent, we will still be recommending that people who are unvaccinated uh, continue to mask, uh, especially in an indoor setting like you described, where there'd be a large number of people gathered. Uh, this is to protect themselves. Uh, the best protection overall will be if we continue to have such small case numbers, we will have very little virus in our communities that could be transmitted from person to person, and that would be the ultimate goal. So if there are some people who can't be vaccinated for whatever reason, uh, they may still benefit from the fact that so many of the rest of the community have been vaccinated, uh, allowing the virus to essentially not become a factor in most uh, decision making. I'll let the governor come back for the other question. Mike, what I can tell you is, I did look into that. Uh, what I can tell you is that the uh, the trooper was not uh, released due to a mask restriction. Uh, it, from my perspective, that's what I've learned. Um, but I can't comment further. It's a personnel matter, so I can't get into the, the details. But it was not because of the mask issue. So he was not involved in any sort of mask episode or anything dealing with a mask? I think what your Just question got suspended or anything. Yeah, what what I had understood your question to be was um, for failure. He was uh, he was discharged for failure to wear a mask, and I'm commenting at this point that no, that I, was I, not I, the reason. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not sure if it was failure to wear a mask or it was some sort of confrontation over a mask. Whether the other private citizen wasn't wearing it and they got into some sort of ordeal at a store uh, and it was on apparently maybe off duty and uh, later that the person finally realized who he was when he saw him later in uniform in a cruiser and made a complaint to the Department of Public Safety. Yeah, I, I can't confirm that at this point, Mike. Well, we've asked for the dismissal letter and they still have been sort of stonewalling that. That was due some time ago. Let me let me look into that. I guess we'll keep chipping away. Yep. So. All right, uh, Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good morning again. This question is from a reader who wants to know if those who are unable to find suitable childcare can they reject employment offers or can they fail to complete the job search requirement and still be eligible to receive unemployment benefits? I, th I believe that it would have to be somehow associated with COVID uh, for that to be the reason. But I'll let uh, Mr. Harrington answer. Uh, yes, Governor, uh, you're correct. So uh, the very specific eligibility criteria are specific to COVID specific events. So if someone had their place of childcare uh, closed and no longer available due to COVID um, and they were not able to find uh, childcare elsewhere due to COVID, um, 
then that potentially could be a reason why they don't have to perform the work search and could continue filing. Um, but it's going to be very case specific, so it's hard to it's hard to say that all circumstances would result that way. Um, you know, the individual would have to show that um, their child care that they had prior to COVID was no longer available due to some specific COVID reason. Um, you know, again, maybe they're, uh, they're closed due to an outbreak of some kind or an exposure concern, um, you know, but again, they would have to be able to show that they could not find child care elsewhere um, and that that was also due to COVID-19. Okay, thank you. So then the state general shortage of child care is not, it has to be COVID specific. So the general lack of child care in the state is no excuse. I believe I heard you say. That, that's correct. They would have to show a good faith effort that they have, um, again, tried to find child care um, and that it was not available. And there would have to be some direct nexus to uh, COVID-19. Uh, again, I, it's hard to say that there's one circumstance that fits all um, or one requirement that fits all circumstances. So it's really case specific, but there does have to be a direct connection um, to a loss of child care due to COVID-19. Okay, thank you very much. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Apparently most of us want to talk to you today and not your cabinet. So. Uh, we all love you too, but um, Governor, I wanted to start out with your 80% threshold uh, set for reopening. Uh, obviously, this number uh, is is we're not getting there as quickly as many of us expected. Um, some believe that your 80% threshold is is somewhat arbitrary, um, and, and noting that you know a couple tenths of one percent is statistically minute. Um, as I remember, when you announced that it would be 80% as a goal that we're looking to reach, uh, it, you clarified that part of that was because that would mean that 70% of Vermonters overall would then be vaccinated. And, and we've reached that 70%. Um, I wonder what you would tell people who are questioning that 80% number as being a little bit arbitrary uh, what you would tell them to defend that now that we've reached a 70% threshold for, for partially vaccinated Vermonters? Yeah, well, I would say the 70% 70, uh, 70 goal is arbitrary as well, right? So um, from my standpoint, uh, there's a difference uh, between, you know, 70 and 80%, obviously. Uh, the more work we do right now, um, it's like prevention. Uh, the more work we do now, the better off we're going to be in the fall and the winter. Um, we're, you know, leading the country in this regard. If we can hit the 80%, uh, it will be a, a goal, a milestone uh, that we can all be proud of. Uh, and in fact, will designate us as maybe the only state to have hit that or will hit that, um, which in itself uh, would be, uh, I think, an attraction uh, to many, whether it's for tourism or for people to come and move here, being the safest, healthiest state in the nation, is something that we uh, we could utilize. So I just think <clears throat> it's a, uh, again, I said we would uh, we were going to open up, um, remove all restrictions by the 4th of July, regardless. Um, but uh, we all need goals in life. And this was one uh, that I thought was attainable which I believe, still believe it is, uh, and if we reach it when I think we will, we'll be more than two weeks uh, ahead of schedule. So um, for those who um, are resistant in some respects, uh, maybe they can dig a little bit, a little bit deeper, uh, go to their friends, their neighbors, their, their family, and uh, get them to get their vaccination so we can reach it sooner. We're, we're just 3,129 people away from accomplishing that, and if we, continue uh, at you know a rate of a thousand a day uh, we could hit that that within the week so uh, again i um we set the fourth of july as the final step uh, towards uh, towards normalcy and we're still i'm still committed to that but i but i think this 80 percent goal has been advantageous it worked, made us work a little harder and sometimes again there's a there's a difference between being average being good being okay 
and uh, and being uh, great. And uh, and I think that uh, we have a lot to be proud of in that respect. Okay. Um, lastly, uh, Apple announced in, in just the last few days that they'd be unveiling it, uh, part of their Apple Wallet would be uh, the ability to scan one's photo ID into their phone, and they can could truly use that as a uh, in replace of a conventional wallet. Um, this voluntary feature, both from a state and individual point of view, um, obviously it's geared more towards the younger generations, but I wondered, especially with your initiatives to attract younger Vermonters uh, to the state to keep people here that are, that are younger, that are in the working, um, working age group, uh, if Vermont would be participating in that, in that program with Apple. You know, this is, uh, you're probably asking the wrong person about this. Uh, I, uh, this is the first I've heard of it. Um, obviously, a lot of us uh, traditionalists uh, still carry a wallet with us uh, and still carry cash on us. So uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, obviously, we want to do whatever we can uh, to keep up with, uh, uh, with uh, what's, uh, what's on the horizon and uh, to to react accordingly, but I, I, I'm not sure that, I don't know what would preclude us from utilizing that new technology. Okay, per, uh, perhaps somebody at the DMV would know. Um, okay, thank you, Governor, and uh, I, I suppose we'll talk next week. Thank you. And next we'll go to Ann Wallace Allen, seven days. There were some technical issues, so she just emailed me her question, which I will read. Um, is there anything the state can do about the fact that Flowers Foods, the Georgia-based company that is buying coffee cup foods assets, doesn't plan to reopen the bakeries? Does the state have any kind of program that can lessen the chances that those towns will end up with empty buildings sitting there? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, this was a situation that surprised many of us. But, um, but I think if you get into the details, the receiver uh, of coffee cup uh, is, uh, I, th I believe, will find uh, that it's their obligation uh, to get the best deal they possibly can to take care of those who uh, are um, in line uh, that uh, for some of the debt obligations that need to be made. So uh, this last minute deal obviously came uh, to fruition and uh, they made a decision uh, to pay money for the rights to that um, that to to coffee cup. So uh, again, as frustrating as that might be, I'd rather see the the uh, facilities open back up and people going back to work. Um, but um, but this is within the the receivership. They they um, again they they have an obligation to get the best deal they can. So. I'm still hopeful uh, when we'll see how this all works out over the week. I know that they, there's a comment period uh, for a week and we'll, we'll see if this continues to hold. And uh, at that point, we will be engaging with this, uh, this new, if they're successful, uh, we'll be engaging with them to see what we can do to, to open these facilities back up. So, uh, you know, it's an iconic brand and something that we're, we're very proud of and hopefully uh, they can uh, work that back in and utilize it uh, in their overall uh, business plan. All right, we will move to Pete Hirschfeld, VPR. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Governor, I don't know if this question is for you or somebody on your team, but the eviction moratorium will lift 30 days after you uh, rescind the emergency order in the state. And I'm wondering um, what the administration has been doing to, to try to quantify the number of Vermonters who will be displaced as a result of that moratorium going away, and what sort of supports, if any, you're contemplating to help folks who will be uh, displaced as a result? Yeah, I, I might... Um... I might ask our uh, Commissioner of Housing if uh, he could comment. I don't believe he's on today, uh, Commissioner Hanford, no. Um, we'll get an answer to you, uh, Peter, but 
Uh, obviously, this has gone on for quite some time. Uh, I think that there is, uh, uh, you know, we have some uh, safety nets in place uh, that can be utilized, uh, but uh, but there are also uh, some out there, and I know uh, from from what I'm hearing from some of the landlords uh, that uh, some people are taking advantage of this situation and not paying rent because they don't have to. Uh, so um, we'll see how this all sugars off, uh, but, uh, but we will continue to do whatever we can for those who legitimately uh, can't pay their rent and we will make sure that they have some place to go. Thank you. Uh, and Commissioner Levine, um, it looks like we're going to get uh, a new vaccine on the market that might be safer for uh, immunocompromised Vermonters. I'm wondering if you have any estimate of how many um, immunized compromise, immunocompromised Vermonters we have um, who have not gotten the vaccines that are available now b because of their medical situation. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have a good estimate of that. Um, it's not data that uh, we would normally have collected. The fact of the matter is most people who are immunocompromised are still eligible for the vaccines that are out there now. And if they've elected to not be vaccinated, it's often because of the counsel of their own uh, personal or specialty physician who believes uh, that the risks of stopping the kind of therapy that the person's on that could have been impact their immune system uh, is greater than the risk uh, of getting COVID. Uh, so th we just have to understand that and balance that no matter what kind of vaccine we're talking about. Um, because many have very fragile conditions that require ongoing strong therapies. Um, the other part of that, though, is many people who are immunocompromised have received vaccine and uh, are still wondering how well protected they are. And we do hope by the end of this year, hopefully sooner, there'll be some blood testing that can be done to really quantitate for them uh, their level of protection so they can go about life uh, either more freely or uh, be as uh, stringent with protections like masking and uh, avoiding crowds as they are now. Um, but I don't really have a, a number to give you uh, on either category. Thank you all. Devin Bates, Local 22, Local 44. I can hear you. You can. Yes, question for Dr. Levine. Um, research published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology um, shows that millions of cancer screenings were missed across the U.S. last year due to the pandemic. Um, it's caused decreases in delays in identifying people with cancer and treating them. And then data from the National Cancer Institute is actually suggesting this could result in an additional 10,000 cancer deaths over the next decade. Um, what's your message to people who may have missed a screening last year due to the pandemic? And is there a broader concern about people just not being as in touch with their own health because we kind of, you know, weren't going into the doctor's office the past year? What's the message here as we get back to normal that, you know, getting health care back to normal too for people? Yeah, thank you for this question. Now, all of the above is true that, um, there were cancer screenings missed. There were other types of uh, preventive medicine missed in terms of you know, checking kinds of labs you would check in a routine health visit in terms of cholesterol, blood sugar, et cetera, blood pressure checking. Uh, and then, of course, there was a concern regarding people failing to present with emergency-type symptoms uh, because they were fearing an encounter with the healthcare system uh, and maybe catching COVID because of that. So uh, a lot of things uh, escalating on the concern level that could indicate that there may be more disease out there um, that could have been prevented that will come to light. And uh, 
that will be very unfortunate. I do believe that the research, so, um, and it's probably pretty intuitive to realize that when people were really uh, staying home for long periods of time and were concerned, even though the concerns turn out to be less than appropriate about uh, the safety of the healthcare system, because the healthcare system, at least in Vermont, truly proved to be quite safe. Uh, but the reality was uh, a lot of people were doing telemedicine, et cetera, not being seen in person. So it's, it really was a disruptive time. So as we uh, get to our 80% and um, get to uh, enjoy the summer more, et cetera, we are going to be giving more messaging regarding the kinds of traditional things we do in public health. Uh, so not only would it be uh, alerting people about screenings that are needed, but probably more importantly, sort of the lifestyle changes that we're always talking about that people may have been doing a good job on, but then when the pandemic hit, kind of everything fell apart, related to stress, related to disruption of routines, related to being home more and not doing as much and being less active, all of those things. So there'll be a lot more for us to be talking about in coming weeks and months regarding that. Um, and you're gonna start seeing more, published, more publications that do actually try to dig into uh, the damage, if you will, that might have been done uh, in, in people's health, um, just like the study that you quoted. Great, thank you. And then I had a question for Secretary Smith as well, um, just about the walk-in clinics. You know, as the weeks have gone on, the types of places that these clinics are happening is getting more and more uh, diverse. You have the state parks, the mobile home parks, uh, Jazz Fest in Burlington. I'm just curious what uh, the turnout has been like at these. Um, I know it's hard to kind of compare each one. You have uh, different crowds of people, different amounts of people at each one, but what are you seeing from all of these different events, and uh, was there anything that really stood out to you uh, when it comes to the past couple weeks with these? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, you forgot the dumps. We're looking at dumps as well, uh, go going to dumps on weekends. The, um, as the governor had mentioned, we're not expecting the, like the mass vac turn the mass vax turnouts that we were originally that we originally sort of um, brought up and brought online where we had thousands of people a day going through these mass vac sites we're down to the point where if we get you know two three ten twenty um, we're happy um, that is something that we are striving for now and and it's been successful in in doing this broad approach and maybe on a daily basis getting 100 to 200 uh, people vaccinated that's what it's going to take as well as our pharmacy partners I, I can't say enough about our pharmacy partners they have been they have made themselves available and open to people coming into their clinic. So in combination with these sort of pop-up events, including dumps, uh, we, will, um, we will get there. Uh, and with the combination of the pharmacy partner partners, uh, the, the mass vac sites, these mass vaccination sites that are starting to, um, starting to um, change and more into these outreach efforts I think is uh, is what you're going to see in the future, and what will stand up uh, permanently uh, throughout uh, Vermont, because 80% isn't. We're not stopping there. We're keeping going uh, over the next uh, f few weeks and months, and and through uh, through the fall. So this is what we're, this is what Vermonters can expect to see. Um, you know, the only thing we haven't done is gone door to door, and maybe we'll do that. All right, I'll be awaiting a knock. Thank you. <laughs> Aaron Patenko, Vermont Digger. Governor, hey, um, on um, you know the state of emergency, when exactly it will be dropped, um, and for. If there are any um, complications from the issues that you kind of mentioned last week with uh, funding and, and other things like that, um, 
you know, is it is it coming on the day that 80% is hit? Is it coming, you know, on the day when you would normally renew the state of emergency? Are there any more specifics about that? Yeah, we've been working our way through how we unwind the state of emergency to make sure that we haven't, uh, this, anything unanticipated uh, comes up. So we, uh, we've taken care of a, a number of those issues. Uh, we believe that if we, uh, when we, when we uh, get to 80%, uh, we will be able to uh, lift the state of emergency uh, within days of that. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some good news a week from now, and uh, it'll all happen somewhat naturally, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll see. But we think we have all the situations. Uh, um, we contemplated everything. Uh, we have some workarounds. Uh, we want to make sure that we can still continue to, to utilize the funding that's coming to us and, uh, and be able to use uh, like a regular executive order if necessary rather than a state of emergency to do so. So we think we've got it covered at this point, I guess is the bottom line. Okay. Um, do you, uh, so the COVID restrictions that you're listing are in the executive order though, right? So you'll just kind of be removing them from the emergency order, um, you know, and then maybe afterwards with the emergency order itself. Yeah, we could do it one of two ways. Again, it all depends on the timing, and that all depends on Vermonters uh, getting their uh, vaccinations. Um, but uh, <clears throat> if uh, if we do it uh, before, let's say the natural um, um, the fifteenth of June is when the state of emergency uh, ends in some respects, uh, and then we would have to to extend it uh, beyond that. But if it came, let's say we hit 80% uh, three days, four days from now, we could just uh, amend the executive order and just lift those restrictions and then let the uh, state of emergency end on the uh, the 15th. But uh, it all depends, again, if we're, if we're not there quite yet, we may have to extend the state of emergency uh, a little bit further um, before we um, before we lift all the restrictions. So we need that still to be in place. So it will evolve. Okay, we'll we'll just have to see uh, where we're at uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. I also, I have a question for Dr. Levine. Um, you know, I'm looking at the, uh, the vaccine data on the death dashboard and it looks like 12 to 15 year olds are now in the lowest category of uh, vaccine signups or, or vaccine doses um, put out. Is that why you're kind of discussing like the parents getting their vaccines for their kids today? And is there anything else specific that you want to do to address this problem? Yeah, so the answer is yes, that's one of the reasons I am discussing that. I don't want to make it sound like they are, you know, miles behind everyone because they've really come up very nicely and they're in the 50 plus a little percent range at this point in time. Um, and they are the newest group, the most recently eligible. And um, obviously they don't make the decision, their parents do. Uh, and their parents in some cases are being very uh, reserved about it and taking their time and really being thoughtful. Uh, but by the same token, the numbers are increasing. Uh, so. Uh, I would like the message to be that we're encouraged by the progress, considering they're the newest group, but obviously we want to see uh, even better results um, because really, um, as the governor has alluded to in his overall comments, when we're talking about 80%, we're really looking to the fall and winter and making Vermont so safe now uh, and really being able to establish that level of safety and protection that will be durable uh, and get us through in case the fall and winter bring more virus activity. For the uh, adolescents, the same thing is true, not only in protecting themselves, protecting their younger siblings, but also protecting their school year. And once again, you know, our goal is to have them all back in class and to have schools operating uh, at a very high level. And the best way to do that is to make sure that teachers, staff, and students, those eligible students who are currently over age 12, have as high a vaccination rate as possible. And we're seeing the impact of that even now 
uh, where our 12-year-olds could still be at a higher rate, but we're already seeing dramatic drop-offs in the number of school cases and on the impact on schools in general. Um, and so we'd love to see that continue and to build on that success. All right, we'll move to Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Thank you, Jason. Um, Governor, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Secretary Curley about the coffee cup um, situation. I'm sure the story is not over. Is I, I assume, uh, Secretary Curley, that, that um, Flowers Foods did not apply for a veggie award? They did not. And um, it, I'm not sure if you know this off the top of your head, but um, they bought the brands and the uh, uh, the, uh, the thought is that they're, they're going to produce these out of state. Could they still use the Vermont bread brand if it's not made in Vermont? You know, I don't know the answer to all this. Um, as the governor mentioned, we were <laughs> caught by surprise on this. And, and as he articulated, you know, the receiver's first order of business is to the creditors. So right now our team is um, just trying to understand the intentions of flower foods. Uh, Economic Development Commissioner Joan Goldstein has reached out to connect with them as of 10.30 this morning. She still hadn't uh, connected, but there's a lot that we still need to learn. Um, and so I don't have the answer to, you know, whether they can use the, that Vermont brand as a name. I, I imagine that in buying this, they probably have that right, but we truly don't know that at this point. I, I know there's, you know, with um, um, Vermont has been pretty protective of the Vermont brand over the years, and there's been a lot of um, legal issues around around that as well. And the the other question for Commissioner Harrington is is did anything come from the possible Warren Act violation uh, concerning the original closure of of Coffee Cup and Vermont Bread? And if if you know, does it even matter at this point? Uh, thanks for the question. We did receive a response uh, to our inquiry about Warren. Um, the department hasn't made a formal determination on that. Uh, to your point, though, I think the ultimate goal uh, is to ensure that the employees receive the benefits and the pay that they um, believe they're entitled to. And so it sounds like there may be that opportunity through the purchasing of the company. So um, we haven't responded with a formal uh, follow-up yet, uh, and it's with our legal team. Uh, but they did respond, uh, and they did cite that, um, you know, the, the work that they were doing right up to the day of closure was all around trying to secure financing. Uh, and keep the doors open. Um, so it, it's likely it would fall under the exemption uh, for the timeliness portion of the Warren Act requirement. Um, we just haven't uh, come to a final uh, determination on that. All right, great. Thanks. That's all I have. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, you probably saw where uh, by July, Claremont, New Hampshire, is going to open up a new 10,300-square-foot liquor and wine outlet. Uh, and they've been sort of going across the state along the Vermont border, um, putting these very large and robust uh, liquor stores in. Um, and a lot of the liquor store owners in Vermont are concerned as this continues to happen, particularly if they're close to the border, that it's going to be very hard for them to continue doing business if they can keep them go across the border and buy liquor at lower prices and tax free. As have you and your team been watching this? Um, obviously, it's always been a concern uh, in terms of New Hampshire and uh, their involvement in the liquor wholesale business and without tax, as you mentioned. So. Uh, we've made great strides, I believe, in, uh, in competing with New Hampshire. I think we've, we've uh, narrowed the gap uh, significantly, uh, but we're going to have to work a little bit harder, and we're, we'll do whatever we can uh, to make sure that we compete. Um, but um, 
But it's difficult, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, it's not so difficult when, you know, on the other side uh, of the state or on the southern uh, border. Uh, but uh, certainly to our east, it's been, uh, it's been difficult. Okay, thank you. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Oh, yeah, good day. Um, I will return to the issue of uh, people who are working at home. There are, of course, some tremendous advantages, the uh, not wasting commuting time, commuting expense, air pollution, traffic congestion. Uh, does the Department of Labor keep track of businesses and uh, whether or not the people who work at home are productive? Is there a way of tough checking that, measuring it? It, yeah, I'm, there are. I'm happy to, to jump in on that. Okay, there are measurements, uh, obviously, uh, that uh, each company uh, would be responsible for. It's their business. Uh, they have to determine that. Uh, but if you're asking about uh, state employees, uh, might uh, might ask uh, Commissioner Harrington to comment, but also uh, Secretary Young if she has any comments either, as well. Thank you. It, to the specific question about the Department of Labor, we don't necessarily track which employers um, allow their employees to work from home. Uh, and in terms of uh, the same line, not, uh, we don't follow their productivity. As the governor mentioned, each employer, you know, would have to determine what uh, production looks like uh, through remote work. Um, I'm assuming more information and, and there'll be plenty more studies coming out of the pandemic because this seems to be more of a, a national conversation. Um, but, you know, in terms of the Vermont Department of Labor, um, we don't distinguish uh, in terms of uh, employees, whether or not they work remotely or they work in an office setting. It's just not a, a data point that we, we capture. As it Effective for the uh, state employees. Yeah, uh, Secretary Young, do you have any any comments on this? Yeah, for the state employees, um, Governor, uh, we have uh, asked all of the departments and agencies over the next uh, sixty days or so to come up with productivity measures. How we're going to measure productivity for those who. Uh, employees who decide that they would like to apply to work remotely uh, after September 1st. So we are going to start measuring um, productivity by program by program. We have not you know, finalized that work yet. And then we also will have a better idea once the um, application process under our current policy kicks back in in September to um, account for the number of employees who are in some version of remote work. Thank you very much. Aaron Calvin, the Stowe Reporter. Hi. Um, my question is kind of a follow-up to uh, Stuart and uh, Peters um, about the eviction moratorium ending and um, the number of homeless currently being housed in hotels being reduced. Um, I'm just curious, I know that um, there is money currently being set aside or, or being allocated towards um, you know, building more housing, but um, I think anyone who looked, who's been looking for an apartment or any kind of you know rental housing in Vermont right now can see that um, there is very little available. And um, as I understand it from talking to different organizations, um, there you know affordable housing is already like you know very overtaxed and there's a huge wait list. So um, I'm just curious, you know, understanding that these two uh, events are going to put even further pressure on an already, uh, you know, very stressed housing market. You know, I'm just curious if there are any specifics on what the exact plan is um, for providing, you know, these people who might be kicked out of their homes or are leaving the hotels with, you know, safe housing. Well, again, um, to reiterate what uh, Secretary Smith has said before, and I'll ask him to comment as well, 
Um, but uh, when we received word <clears throat> that uh, we were going to receive funding uh, that was somewhat flexible, a uh, billion dollars uh, of, uh, of ARPA money that was going to be available to us, um, I thought it was necessary to, to look uh, at uh, what we could do with this money uh, in the future to solve some of the, the problems that existed pre-pandemic. Uh, so one of those, obviously, was housing, broadband housing, uh, water, sewer, um, uh, climate change mitigation, and so forth. So uh, we put forth a plan for utilizing 250 million of that uh, towards uh, housing uh, for the workforce, uh, housing uh, for the homeless in particular, uh, the first tranche of money, um, so that we could uh, we could hit the ground running. So we are continuing uh, to move in that direction. Uh, we know there's going, there is need here in the state of Vermont. We knew it before the pandemic, and the pandemic has just uh, exacerbated uh, the situation. So we, um, we again wanted to take and carve out $250 million for housing uh, because we know uh, that uh, there's tremendous need. As we saw during the pandemic, um, we spent with FEMA dollars around $70 million uh, for temporary housing. And the answer from our perspective is trying to find permanent housing uh, for those instead of temporary housing. So, and we know the 70 million a year was going to climb, as Secretary Smith had said, to maybe over 100 million. And that's just unsustainable uh, to us as a state. So uh, the answer is permanent housing. And that's why we're moving forward. Uh, Secretary Smith. Yeah, I, I just want to mention um, where we were in in the hotel motel voucher system, where we went and where we're trying to get back to uh, as we move forward here. We were spending about five to seven million dollars pre-pandemic on the hotel motel program. And as I said, it was a very, very different program. Uh, than than it exists today. During when the pandemic hit, we decided to lift all eligibility requ uh, requirements and open it up to a wide variety of people that may have been experiencing dislocation or homelessness. In doing that, uh, we went from a, 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 a program that was a, around five to seven million dollars to all in inclusive to the end of the year, about $96 million on a fiscal year basis. We were looking at this increasing to um, $106 million in FY22. Uh, so something uh, definitely had to be done. It was unsustainable. So what we did is we, we met with advocates, we met with legislators, and we came to an agreement that A, permanent housing is the only way to resolve this issue. And as the governor said, the governor put forth over $250 million of uh, money for housing, 130, 120 of which has been, um, has been appropriated in this upcoming fiscal year mm. for housing for th this displaced population, these ho the homeless, as well as others that are in involved in, uh, that need housing. In addition, there's rental subsidies that have been made available uh, through the ERAP program. And we, just to, just to re reiterate, we've, we're spending almost $38 million on the hotel motel program this year to make sure that we don't, um, that, that we ease into uh, the permanent solutions in terms of housing, uh, permanent housing, and in terms of rental subsidies. $38 million uh, as opposed to pre-pandemic, which was five to seven million dollars. Also, we are providing, as, as I had mentioned earlier, um, different eligibility requirements that really focus on those that are housing households with children, people with disabilities, and older Vermonters. And this is, um, this is a more expanded criteria than we, we had before. And then also we are, preventing, we are providing a subsidy for those that are leaving the hotel motel program 
with a subsidy in order, a $2,500 subsidy in order to help them transition back to, in many cases, like I had mentioned, friends and family, maybe in an apartment, maybe other things that they could do as we're, we're moving forward. So a, a lot is being done, a lot of money still is being done to, uh, to transition this hotel motel program. Um, it's been done carefully, carefully uh, over the course of the last several months in terms of what we're doing. And then we have to look forward to 2023 and look at how we even transition it and step it down more to get it uh, more sustainable. And back to the program where all of a sudden you're homeless for a night and then the program takes over. That's the original intent of the program. That's where we need to get back to. And I think in 2023, we have to uh, transition to that size of a program. So a lot's going on here. Okay, I appreciate the response. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Guy Page. Uh, Governor, picking up on Ed Barber's question. Parking rides are being expanded across the state, and the transportation bill has a pilot program for big employers to reduce commuter traffic, all for carbon emission reduction. Uh, should these perhaps be paused while the state assesses just how many former commuters won't be driving to work anymore? I think we're going to continue uh, to see the need uh, for the park and rides uh, that we have and the expansion that we're putting into place at this point. Um, I think the biggest gain we're going to see in terms of uh, reduction of carbon emissions will be uh, electric vehicles. And we've seen and heard a lot of news over the last uh, couple of years on this issue. And certainly over the last couple of weeks uh, with the Ford F-150 coming out, uh, the F-150 Lightning, uh, which is uh, is going to be, I think, a game changer uh, for uh, many. So uh, this is going to escalate. Uh, I don't know as we're going to eliminate the need for, especially in a rural state like Vermont, uh, the need for a, a vehicle. Uh, I think we're still going to have that. And uh, but I think the electric vehicles are the answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, Governor, Commissioner Levine said at the beginning of this press conference about vaccination that uh, I think his words were long-term adverse, adverse effects are just not being seen. Yet anecdotally and on the CDC website, they are being seen or at least recorded. And what I'm sort of sensing is like this unhealthy polarization and mistrust. And I wonder if either you or he could give a brief but definitive scientific summary about the relative risk of illness or death as a result of vaccination. I might ask uh, Commissioner Levine to comment on that, but, uh, but I, I do want us to consider as a country, uh, we've now hit the 300 million uh, vaccine mark, which is remarkable. So uh, again, there is risk in everything that we do, and I'm sure there's some risk here as well, but Commissioner Levine. I think, Guy, uh, you've got to differentiate the risk at the time of vaccination within the first couple weeks versus what we would term long-term risk. Obviously, the two biggest uh, things in the news have been from the messenger RNA vaccines, anaphylaxis, which occurs at a very, very low rate and is usually medically manageable. And then with the Johnson & Johnson, the very rare occurrence of the blood clotting disorder. So we can't ignore these things, but again, we need to put them in the context of hundreds of millions of doses. And the fact that um, they occur at all, the fact that we can actually say they occur at all shows that the surveillance systems are actually working well. We have a vaccine adverse event reporting system 
<clears throat> which is a treasure trove of reports, but most of the reports are self-reported um, or observer-reported and occasionally by the healthcare system reported, and they need to be sorted through um, by the CDC and the FDA. And that's a very time-consuming, lengthy process because they want to encourage reports, and the numbers that they get, you know, are more than they can process uh, in a real-time, rapid fashion. So we still have to learn from that. But the reality is, we're not hearing about what I'm calling long-term effects of vaccine. And that would mean things that, you know, didn't just occur at the time you got the shot and are expected and show that you're reacting to the vaccine and building up an immune response, but things that are going to uh, be present months and months later. We do know for a fact that there's a good cohort of people who have had COVID who have symptoms months and months later. So we need to sort of balance things with the risk of the illness itself versus the risk of the vaccine. And currently, it's hard to give you a full assessment of that because we just don't have the full richness of the reporting system's results based on the fact that there are just so many reports that they have to sort through, most of which are acute reports from the time they got the vaccine as opposed to long-term reports. But we just don't have that level of data to, to provide you with. But I would still look at it as a risk-benefit uh, kind of enterprise, and the risk of the vaccine is proving to be very, very, very small. And the risk of getting COVID, uh, we're learning more and more about, uh, is for many people not so much fun and can have very enduring effects. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this is probably for Secretary French. Um, Heard uh, some lengthy comments uh, recently from a local school board member that said he was fairly well exhausted and finished with remote meetings and thought it was high time for the board to begin in-person meetings again. Uh, similar to Mike Donahue's question earlier, when, when restrictions get lifted uh, and in-person meetings begin, will school boards uh, not have to concern themselves with uh, limited use of school facilities and, and monitoring masks and vaccinations and things like that. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, you know, I think well, Dr. Levine will share with you, I think the general recommendation will be that anyone who's unvaccinated uh, should continue to be wearing a mask. Uh, but other than that, I don't anticipate uh, any restrictions on use at school facilities. So uh, from the school board's obligation in that scenario, do they need to do more than just say, post a sign on the school board meeting room door, or do they actually have to try to enforce uh, unvaccinated people and, and, and determine who is and is not? No, I, you know, we'll certainly work through that with the school board's association, but I think, you know, what I'm thinking about in terms of post-emergency uh, order is that the onus and the responsibility shifts to the individual as opposed to the school or the school board. Uh, so I think, you know, to, notice, to put that notice out there is, is going to be useful, but it's really up to individuals to do what's right. And then uh, while I have a few, um, I see, at least I believe, uh, last week was the deadline for schools to be submitting their recovery plans to AOE. Um, I'm just curious what the next steps are from AOE's perspective. Is, is there a review process, a feedback, uh, 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 an approval of the plans, or... Um, or how does that work on your agency? You know, we're certainly reviewing the plans. Um, I will say, you know, our process, what we articulated to be the recovery process, was co-opted to a certain extent uh, by a new federal planning requirement. Uh, when the ARP, uh, American Rescue Plan Act was passed and school districts received another tranche of federal funding, uh, they attached a new federal planning requirement um, with those funds. So a lot of what's been going on, certainly uh, managing the end of the pandemic, but in terms of planning, 
is helping districts, um, you know, use that recovery planning process, which was essentially a Vermont planning process, uh, to support the federal requirements under uh, the ARP program. So we've been working, basically holding weekly meetings with school districts to help them uh, pull those things together. Uh, we think our planning process, our Vermont planning, recovery planning process, can be extremely useful uh, for them in accomplishing uh, that federal requirement. Thank you for your time. Julie Wernow, The Wall Street Journal. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, this is for Commissioner Levine. Um, so when we hit this 80% mark, can Vermont declare herd immunity and how should Vermonters expect daily life to change as a result? And, and if not, what metric would you use to declare herd immunity in Vermont? <clears throat> Welcome to our uh, queue. Um, I've been trying to train. Thank you. Uh, I've been trying to train most of our Vermont um, journalists to avoid the word herd immunity um, and community immunity, uh, and try to use example instead. Because I don't think you'll find anyone in the country yet who will give you the number that equates with that immunity, but. It could be in the 60 to 70% range, which means we left it in the dust long ago, or it could be in the 80 to 90% range, which means we're still getting closer and need to achieve it. But if we look at the country's experience right now with averaging out the country, um, they're at a much lower level than we are in Vermont, and we're seeing less cases everywhere, less hospitalizations. You know, Statistics are looking uh, much more favorable at this point in time. The belief I have is that this concept of immunity for the community, at the community level, um, we all contribute to it. And rather than focus on the number, we should focus on the results. Because the fact is, what we've seen so far, even when we had only the most vulnerable in Vermont vaccinated, we saw a dramatic impact on that over 65 and especially nursing home population. That's persisted with less cases, less deaths, and, and those people. We're now at the level where we can't vaccinate people under 12, but we can certainly vaccinate the teenagers and the teachers. And already, we're seeing vanishing numbers of cases in schools. Uh, and that's without actually picking a number uh, of what level of immunity we may or may not be at. 80% is certainly a great place to be. Something higher than that would be even a better place to be. Because the reality is, we want to make sure that there's so many people that are vaccinated that what little virus might encounter them in Vermont just won't be transmitted from one person to another. And we're finding that um, unvaccinated people are somewhat protected by the fact that so many people are vaccinated as well because of the fact that there's less virus circulating. But they're not totally protected, and that's why it's important for them that if they are eligible for vaccine, they seek the vaccine and consider themselves amongst those protected. Because certainly virus can be transmitted between va unvaccinated people um, anytime. And those are the kinds of cases we're going to see in the future. So, you know, in addition to the lifting of the few remaining restrictions, when we reach the 80% level, um, that essentially tells Vermonters their life is really going to be much closer to what they considered normal in pre-pandemic before, because there's not going to be restrictions on gathering size. There's not going to be restrictions on where they choose to, or not choose to eat or drink or anything of that sort. 
Um, and we very incrementally have been opening up all aspects of Vermont uh, over time uh, in a very phased and gradual way. So um, I don't think they have, um, you know, some number that they're going to associate some new freedom with at this point in time because uh, they know what to expect at 80 percent and they're already seeing the benefits of a high level of vaccine. My goal is, though, again, to keep Vermont as the safest state to live in, uh, to come to want to live in and work in and uh, et cetera and recreate in, and a very high vaccine rate will help us accomplish that very effectively. All right. Thank you. We'll move to uh, Greg, the Bennington Banner. Uh, hello and good afternoon. Um, this question might be for um, Secretary Harrington, or excuse me, Commissioner Harrington or Secretary Curley. Um, in the event that Flowers Foods does not decide it's going to continue operations of Coffee Cup or Vermont Bread Company, uh, I'm just wondering what the thought is about whether to pursue another uh, baking or similar operation or an owner who might be able to, you know, build a facility or uh, come up or find an existing facility it can purchase or otherwise repurpose uh, to try to continue with those workers in that same industry, or whether there is, uh, or whether to start pursuing sort of a transferable skills model um, and start uh, seeing if, uh, if, if those uh, employee skills can be uh, uh, transitioned into other fields or whether we, uh, whether training and reskilling is, is the way to go. I was wondering if we're, if, we're, if you're thinking about those options as, as uh, we're approaching, uh, trying to find out what Flowers Foods is going to do. Um, Greg, maybe before they uh, add to that, I just want to say that this is all new, uh, the Flowers uh, um, food coming into the picture. Uh, they have commented that they don't intend uh, to open up uh, right now, but that doesn't preclude them from opening up in the future or maybe even contemplating what they're going to do with the brands. So I still have hopes uh, that they will see the merit in opening up the facilities uh, to, in some capacity right here in Vermont. Uh, in terms of the, the short, in the short term, uh, there is a lot of opportunity in Vermont. We have a workforce shortage. We had a workforce shortage uh, pre-pandemic and uh, the pandemic has uh, exacerbated that. And so we are in a situation where uh, we certainly could use each and every employee that's been displaced uh, as a result of uh, Coffee Cup. So uh, again, we'll continue to try and do whatever we can for the individual employees to make sure that they find a place to go uh, and be able to stay right here in Vermont. Um, but on the, other, uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, we want to uh, welcome, if, if uh, Flower Foods is, uh, is the apparent uh, high bidder, uh, if um, we want to welcome them in, into the state and f find a pathway for them to do business here and manufacture here and and to process here. So um, with that, maybe uh, Commissioner Curley or, or, or Secretary Curley or Commissioner Harrington might be able to add more to that. All right, you did great. Uh, you know, our teams, the, the labor and the uh, Commerce and Community Development teams have been working together this morning to talk about, just as the governor said, um, certainly we want to get an understanding from Flower Foods. Uh, we don't want to make any assumptions that they're not planning to be here. And so if they're planning to be here, we want to do everything we can to welcome them here and, and bring those jobs back. We know that there are employees who took other jobs that really wanted to, to be back doing what they were doing before um, and, and thought that there was hope for that. So there was certainly some disappointment um, there. But again, uh, you know, if, if uh, Flower Foods has no intention of coming back into Vermont, we will do everything we can to try to repurpose those facilities or invite other um, new uh, businesses into our state. and. Um, as well, uh, Commissioner Harrington can speak to this a little bit more, but we are certainly hearing from employers who are, are looking to hire those 
impacted employees now. They they need them now, and they possess the skill sets they need. So um, we have a lot of hope that, that things will turn out okay, but certainly do. Um, we're all feeling a bit of disappointment at the thought that maybe, you know, this is not going to, to come back in the way we thought it was over the last couple weeks. But, um, again, we're going to we're gonna deploy all of our resources to try to make this outcome be the best that it can possibly be for all of Vermont. Mike, you have anything uh, thank to add? Thank you. No, I think uh, you you really hit on all the high points. Uh, obviously, we're continuing to work with the impacted employees, those that haven't been able to find other employment yet, to um, help them either build skills or just continue searching for um, uh, a job that uh, or a career change that uh, they're interested in. Um, obviously, uh, as we learn more over the coming days, um, you know, we'll know better as to whether or not um, we're helping them find uh, other employment or whether there may be opportunities um, with this new, um, this new development. So um, with that, I think uh, both uh, Secretary Curley and the governor um, certainly hit on all the, the key points. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner, do you happen to know what percentage of uh, Coffee Cup slash Vermont Bread Company workers have found um, other employment to this, to this point? Uh, I don't. Uh, I may be able to find that out uh, and by going back to our team and pulling numbers uh, from our system. So I'll see if I can um, get back to that. I know a lot of them have been able to find other work, uh, but let me see if I can mm. get, a number, get a number and get that back to you, Greg. Okay, I would appreciate that. Um, one last question, uh, perhaps for the governor, perhaps for Secretary French, or maybe both of you. Uh, so, uh, Governor, I did see that you signed S-13 yesterday, which establishes a task force for addressing um, new waiting, uh, new per pupil waiting. Um, obviously, this, this is a legislative task force, so it's still cart in front of the horse a little bit, but eventually what they produce will uh, possibly come to you. I was wondering if, uh, if uh, you have any... Um, uh, if there's any sense of what you're looking for out of uh, out of moving forward with uh, per people uh, factors or a, a way to implement them since he did sign the bill? Yeah, I, I think uh, we'll have to wait for the results of the study uh, to see what they they find and what they're contemplating. And uh, as you know, with the legislative process, uh, this will have a lot of twists and turns uh, before it's over. So probably way too soon for me to comment. Um, we do have, obviously, uh, throughout, you know, I've talked about this over the last four or five years with the declining population of, of uh, in the workforce, as well as the declining population in our schools. Um, we, uh, we have uh, an issue here in the state that we need to rectify, and I believe bringing more people into the state is part of the answer. Um, but in the meantime, having parity throughout the state in the rural sections of Vermont I think is important so that um, so that everyone's getting a, an equal uh, and positive uh, and influential uh, education as possible. All right. Uh, thank you. Avery Powell, WCAX. That's all. Can you all hear me okay? We can. We could. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Governor, my question is also about S13, but I just kind of wanted to get your perspective on whether you think the pandemic will change the amount of money going to schools, largely increasing the amount of money taxpayers will spend. I uh, would hope not. Um, we, you know, we, we invest a lot in education in the state. Um, probably one of the highest per pupil costs of any state in the country. So. I think what we need to do is look at a system that um, that is as efficient as possible while gain, giving us the highest quality. So uh, I think that that's our, you know, our charge. Uh, that's uh, going to be our challenge. And uh, but I think it's doable. In fact, I think with the pandemic, we may see uh, opportunities uh, for uh, doing things with more remote learning uh, within the classrooms from one uh, community to another uh, so that we don't replicate uh, some of the education that we have right now. We might be able to, to utilize again. If you have a program that's happening 
in another part of Vermont. You might be able to, to uh, have instruction in a, a smaller rural uh, community to access that. So I think there's, a, there's some opportunity here that we need to contemplate and be as nimble as possible. And, uh, and again, with the, with the bottom line being we want the highest education um, uh, we, can, we can possibly have, the highest quality education we can possibly have at a, at a price we can afford. So I think we're, uh, we're spending enough, we're, we're investing enough in education now. I just think that we need to think about how do we do it better. And is, does more remote learning then mean more broadband access? Which is why we want to invest, you know, the $250 million that I had uh, put forth out of the uh, ARPA money uh, was uh, something that I think will virtually maybe solve the entire problem uh, or get us much closer to the goal of having universal access to broadband throughout the state. So, yes, it goes hand in hand. Great. And Dr. Levine, just a quick unrelated COVID question. Um, I'm sure you've seen that there's a new Alzheimer's treatment drug, the first one in nearly 20 years. Vermont has a pretty an older population. What is, could you, what is your take on the drug? I know there's kind of been some, um, some disputes over its effectiveness. Yes, thanks, Avery, for that question. I was thinking I'd probably get one on that, and I don't want to weigh in as a definitive authority. Number one, um, the decision to approve it was fraught with controversy. Number two, though there is evidence that it may be effective, there was also some evidence to the contrary. And number three, it's quite expensive. So we want to make sure that Vermonters who might be placed on it get the value that it could hold. I don't think, uh, except for those involved in the uh, decision making regarding approval of the drug, that any of us have enough uh, background in the studies yet to really weigh in. Uh, I'll be looking at that very, very closely. Just so the public knows, the value of this, uh, if it uh, actually achieves the value that uh, it, its promise holds, is that it would be a treatment to be delivered early on in Alzheimer's and make an impact not only then, but hopefully forestalling other things down the road. So that's a heavy lift for a drug to do. It implies you can actually identify the population that would be eligible for it and make sure that the appropriate people get on it as early as possible and that it would have these long-term impacts. So I, again, I don't want to suck the wind out of the sails, but I also don't want to overbill it as the greatest promise that we've ever seen uh, until I have a chance to really uh, evaluate it further and uh, really let the medical and uh, neurology and psychiatric communities all weigh in as well, because um, it's all pretty much new on the scene uh, in the last 24 hours, and most don't have as much background in it yet as we need. Thank you. Mike, True North reports. Mike, True North reports. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Um, we'll see you again next Tuesday. Hopefully we'll have some good news for you by then. Um, but if you can all do your part and try and get all those uh, in your circle of friends and family who haven't been vaccinated to be vaccinated, we have all kinds of opportunity, whether it's in our pharmacies or all the pop-up clinics that we have available. So uh, again, thank you all very much for tuning in.